semi flustered from having to uh, send out that last minute email, but now I'm back. I'm back. So uh, most of you have been on in weeks previous, so I probably don't need to say it, but I'll just start off by saying that uh, the format is I'm going to give a little presentation at the beginning and then uh, following the presentation, uh, we'll, we'll open it up to discussion. This week is slightly different, little change in the format, and then in that I've asked three uh, friends who've recently been working on projects involving traveling to just talk about uh, those three projects briefly. So it's going to be, the format will be, I'll finish my presentation, then I'll switch it over to them one at a time. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be like a formal artist talk where they show slideshows or anything, just to comment on the topic and talk, and talk about how it's, uh, something that's been close to their heart recently as well. So that's the uh, format for today. And uh, of course, I'm sure everyone saw the title is uh, uh, Traveling to Photograph Rewards and Pitfalls. So more on the rewards, but I do want to mention the pitfalls towards the end. Um, I think that this is uh, this week's is sort of a counterpoint to the one on domestic focus. You know, photographer at home, this is going to be the photographer getting out of the house and going out into the world, right? Um, so Dennis Santella earlier on Instagram asked me what I meant by travel, and I wound up just quoting back the Oxford English Dictionary, one of the entries. So I'll read that here as well, which is to make a journey, especially of some length or to a distant and foreign land. So, I mean, I think a lot of us have gone and done projects that are maybe within a couple of hours of home and you get back at the end of the day and maybe you eat a meal at home and sleep in your own bed. And I think that can be considered travel too, but for, for the concentration that I was gonna look at today, I'm much more specific to journeys that are the kind of thing that you're really making a conscious effort to go somewhere to, to like get away from home and go somewhere else, right? Uh, so, of course, many of us travel for photographing. It's very common to have at least, you know, one of many projects that are close to your heart that you wound up working on away from home. Uh, the first photographer that really came to mind when I thought about this was this guy here, uh, Kai McBride, shameless plug, uh, about face picture in Tampa, my book, uh, available on Amazon.com, shameless plug, hashtag shameless plug again. And uh, of course, I'm not from Tampa. The first time I went down there, I started photographing. I only made trips back to photograph. And uh, except for the last time I made an, I did an artist talk at the uh, Museum of Photographic Arts down there. And there was an article in the local newspaper saying, who is this uh, Columbia professor coming down and telling us about Tampa? And they were slightly up in arms, although no protesters showed up. So the overview of this presentation, I kind of broke it into um, the urge and the, the travel, like the history of travel and kind of that urge to go out into the world and, and photograph sort of from a more historical perspective, working our way down to contemporary, um, like the artist on the road in the United States, especially. I, I would say this talk is probably more specific to, you know, American slash United States photographers, just in the nature of the way I put it together. So mea culpa there. Um, also talking about, you know, part of the urge is going back to this idea of like the hero's journey. Then I'll get into the rewards. I'll end with the pitfalls and then we'll uh, open it up from there. So I'm going to share my screen now and start showing slides. Let me get this up. All right. Lightroom. So uh, the urge, right? Exploration and the urge to go out and do something. I, the first thing I thought of, and maybe being out here out west now is, you know, all of the early explorers like Coronado, uh, let's see, Ponce de Leon, um, Henry Hudson, Lewis and Clark, all before the age of photography and people had to make great descriptions and like try to make flowery language and get people excited about what they were doing and to bring back the interest. But as soon as photography came along, it's like exploration and photography go hand in hand right from the beginning, right? So, uh, you know, the journey west and this kind of urge to go out and look at everything. Uh, of course, Carlton Watkins, 
photographing out west and going around with his donkeys laden down with his glass plates and looking at the you know the boom of the gold rush and everything out in california you know very iconic kind of work that we all have seen of course curtis and uh, all those photographs from the native americans out here you know for better or for worse people have pointed out a lot of errors in that work later but whatever uh, Timothy O'Sullivan, of course, another like classic, these depictions of that, the world that we hadn't yet fully explored and bringing that back. And it taught so much about that part of uh, the American West and our idea of what it was. So much so that I think, uh, you all have just mentioned Mark Klett, but some of you might know this project, the Rephotographic Survey Project, where uh, Mark, Ellen Manchester, and Joanne Verberg went back and found all of those, you know, these locations, I think about 120 of them are in the book and re-photograph them what they look like now. It's so Im imprinted on us, this kind of view of the city. I mean, sorry, of the country. But of course, a lot of these were finance trips, you know, and or they were survey trips and there was like formal reasons for them. And it made me also think of another sort of formal reason why people went out to try to photograph in these places, meaning the FSA, right? The FSA photographers like Evans, Dorothea Lang, right, Russell Lee, Marion Post Wolcott. That's a great photograph of her in the snow. You know, uh, of course, Gordon Parks too in there. You know, they were also going out, but again, under that that umbrella of the FSA, and you know, there's issues of propaganda and everything else mixed up in that work. So I think the first thing that we wind up, oh, and then I also think that if you're not studying the photography and you're not in that world the other place that this was coming to everyone was from picture magazines life magazine the idea of these picture stories and journeys and of course we can't get away from thinking of the national geographic right people also used to subscribe to uh they get subscriptions to these stereo cards and they like oh let's make a journey through you know this part of europe you know notre dame paris and they would get you know 20 of these at a time and people would look through them and they'd go on these literally go on these photographic journeys. So there was this appetite for this kind of thing and it was kind of instilled uh, in us. And of course, family photographs, you're going out on these trips and you're posing in front of the monuments and you know, all of these sorts of things get kind of ingrained. But I think Walker Evans, American Photographs, you know, 38, this comes out, of course, for the people who actually saw the, uh, uh, the exhibition at MoMA. This is now we're bringing it from that kind of world into for better or worse, the art world and um, working within the uh, museums and galleries. And now we start looking at this work slightly differently, I would say. And of course, this book being so seminal and so launching a thousand ships, the main ship, of course, being this book, The Americans with Robert Frank. I mentioned this in my email. I mean, no need to see too many of these. I'm sure we're all very familiar with these photographs, but that you know, that journey began this idea of the road trip and getting on the road. Uh, There's a classic photograph of Friedlander, self-portrait. You can see his Leica shadow on the hood of his truck uh, going through out there on the American landscape. You know, he's going to New Orleans, he's going out west, traveling all over, taking the family on uh, summer trips everywhere. And again, photographing the west, photographing these ma the monumental landscapes dovetailing in with uh, the, you know, the United States and car culture and the vast spread of the land. Uh, Gary Winogrand's 1964 Guggenheim work, straight out of, you know, if Robert Frank was taking uh, American photographs with them, then, you know, Winogrand had, had brought in the Americans and to his mind and what he was looking for as he went out on the road. So, I still think now that we talk about like the artist on the road and you know why you know what is the reason why there's this kind of urgent desire to do it it's not just because your photographic heroes did it but I think there's this idea of like the call to adventure and this idea this romantic idea of the artist uh going on the hero's journey um you know did it's not just that uh, you're you're going out to photograph but that you're going to go out and pay some sort of personal price uh, you're going to go through something and not only are you going to come back from it as a changed person yourself but that you're going to have this photographic evidence of the journey that you went on right 
So uh, it's no longer just the showing the places that you would see in the National Geographic, but showing other stuff that maybe was uh, something that the, the artists themselves had to pay the price to get access to. Uh, here's a couple of photographs from Bill Burke, who photographed uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and was shooting with Type 55 film. So he'd, he'd get access to uh, these people who would be otherwise be very distrustful, but he's giving away prints because he's peeling off the 55 film and giving away prints. But and this is one of the last photographs in the book, Minefield, and it's scratched on the negative that uh, he was on his way back to Bangkok and got in a terrible accident, uh, broke his neck. So literally paying a price for going out and making the work. And I thought of Robert Polidori going in and photographing uh, Pripyat and uh, Chernobyl, you know, literally exposing himself to potential radiation. Um, this probably launched a different set of ships, which was the beginning of probably ruin porn, but maybe we could argue that ruin porn was already there. But there was something again about this idea that someone went somewhere that you didn't have access to and brought you there and they, you know, they paid some sort of price for it. Or maybe it's that they got access to a community that you didn't have access to. This is Mary Ellen Mark uh, from that project working with uh, Tiny for all those years. And, uh, you know, she, she met these kids, she spent time with them, you know, all the way up until, you know, the end of her life, she was still photographing a uh, tiny, she became so involved with her. Uh, I thought of also of Kadelka, right? Kadelka being literally uh, without a home, without a country, and starts photographing the gypsies and following them around and, you know, seeing parallels between his own life and theirs. And again, bringing us into a community that was tight knit and hard for a lot of people to get access to, right? This is Susan Mizalis's uh, Carnival Strippers. Uh, she traveled all around uh, New England, mostly uh, in, during the summers following these traveling uh, carnivals and photographing, you know, the, these women who are working bar, you know, out there with the barker out front, behind the scenes and some kind of wild stuff on the inside too, but again, paying the price to get access and, and get a hold of all these things. Uh, more contemporary work, this is Justine Kurland. Um, she spent many years living on the road and on the road with her young son and doing a various number of projects. And so a lot of them, a lot of the photographs are from that journey of being on the road permanently or semi-permanently and other people who were kind of living that uh, utopian ideal of being out in the world and not having to be tied to things, right? That's her son. And then I had a couple of other examples, but this is the only one, I only have a couple of from An Mi Lay. I think a lot of times people also photograph to go back and make a connection to home, whether or not it's like an ancestral connection to home or someplace that you left behind a long time ago. So uh, in An Mi Lay's uh, book, Small Wars, she starts off by photographing in Vietnam, uh, where her family's from, and then she moves into looking at all these soldiers playing war games and reenactments and all these things. But it, she roots it in, in going back there into the countryside. And even the last picture from Vietnam is a little more uh, contemporary looking, but a lot of it is this more romantic kind of ideal of going backwards, right? So uh, now thinking about you know, the rewards, uh, you know, maybe why you might be leaving home and going out for these things. So classic photograph of Adams on top of his car with the platform all stuck out, uh, you know, making a Margaret Burke White and literally going out there. Uh, maybe you had to saddle up the donkey with your huge camera and all your plates and you went out into the world. But there's, I think there's this idea, this is Stephen Short, there's a bit of an idea of uh, a photographer wanting to get into like an elevated state of consciousness, right? So you're, you're trying to become a more sensitive or hyper aware observer. You're trying to break from the routine uh, and those domestic routines. If you kind of on autopilot going from the grocery store back home, once you get off the airplane, get in your rental car and you're looking on how to get to your motel, you're much more aware of, you know, oh, this each intersection, and you're aware of uh, the the highway signs, and are you going to miss your exit? And it that automatically sort of changes your focus and your 
awareness of what's around you just because you are in the unfamiliar. I think that's partially uh, what attracts people to it, right? But there's also this idea that maybe there's a, a place away from home, even though as much as you love home, there might be a place that more resonates with uh, you know, your feeling of the kind of place that you want to talk about. Uh, of course, at Jay famously getting up very early in the morning. He did go home at night, but I still thought I could include him. Or John Sarkovsky photographing Minnesota for uh, that early book of his. There's a place that you're you're drawn to, and a, a something about it that it is no other way to speak about it than to go out there, and it's the subject matter that's going to lend itself to uh, what you're trying to say, right? Uh, Edward Weston spending all those uh, years out in the car on not on the working on his Guggenheim project and other times California in the West there was this attraction to the landscape and there was nothing else to be done but to pack everything up uh, in the car and go right so it's maybe it's the place that is resonating with you or maybe it's that call f that uh, hero's journey call to adventure where you think you know there's something uh, there's something I'm missing that I could maybe find if I go out there in the world. You know, you're looking to change yourself. You're looking for maybe that internal journey that's going to be harder to accomplish if you're at home and surrounded by all your comfortable everyday things, right? Photograph of Robert Frank here. And I also think of the idea of broadening your horizons. Uh, you know, how are things different the other place than where you are now? Uh, I think we've all had that childhood experience of going over to spend the night at a friend's house, um, you know, maybe in middle school or something and realizing that they, the food tastes different there, the smells of the kitchen are different, the way the parents interact is so different and everything that you sort of took for granted starts to switch. Or the first time you travel to, uh, you know, a country that's very different than yours, you know, I remember the first time I went to Europe and was in Berlin and kind of shocked to see policemen with uh, dogs on chains or on a leash and they had their automatic weapons and people are drinking beer on the subway and I realized that I really was an American and I'd inherited all of these belief systems that were part of you know what I thought society was and just by traveling it opened and changed that up and and made me more hyper realizing uh, what I had internalized right so maybe that's what you need to do is to you get out in the world just to to break free of that, right? Now, of course, you should be able to do all those sorts of things at home, um, but maybe by going out on this journey, it, it makes it more possible. Uh, I was thinking about how, you know, people seek metaphysical insights from, um, you know, having a sacramental ingestion of peyote or, you know, ritual taking of LSD or something that there's, there's something about trying to give yourself a push or a nudge to get out of those well-worn ruts of your own personal uh, take on outlook on the world. And a journey is a one way of doing that, literally leaving things behind, right? So I'm almost done and then we'll open, I'm gonna go to the, our guests, but um, I did wanna mention some pitfalls because <laughs> I, I certainly experienced these myself. And one of the first things I thought of is maybe you're not really looking for that metaphysical journey. Maybe it's just that you're desperately in need of a vacation and you, you know, you go and you think, oh, this is going to be great. You bring your camera and the camera stays in the bag the whole time. Or you, you know, you come back with two rolls of garbage or something because you really just needed to rest and relax. So that that's a possibility. Uh, or, you know, maybe you just wind up being uh, the tourist yourself because you're just sort of like, overwhelmed by things that are around you and you're somewhere exotic and new and you're like, oh yeah, this is great. And you just like wind up remaking these kind of uh, travel photographs, right? Um, I, I, there is something to be being overwhelmed by things. And I also think there's a tendency for people to uh, pick someplace exotic where a lot of crazy wild things are happening and think that's gonna be the solution uh, to uh, some sort of rut in their work. Um, and I was reminded of this quote by Winogrand uh, the photograph should be more interesting or more beautiful than what was photographed. And a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of flaccid kind of photographs made just by going somewhere where a lot of action and activity and things are happening and yet not making an interesting photograph of it, just, re you know, just photographing the thing that was happening. So that, I think that's a real pitfall is a lot of times people journey someplace, you know, amazing and exotic, and then they come back with these kind of 
blasé photographs of amazing and exotic things. So their photographs aren't very personal. That's not any kind of connection to them. Um, or it's something like this where you just kind of reiterate these uh, cliche topics uh, from the places that you're going, right? Oh, I got to have the Eiffel Tower and a sunset and these sorts of things. And if you're thinking about the medium, using this medium as a means of expression, uh, then when you merely reproduce these images that we've already seen a million times, uh, you know, if you go to Cuba and you bring back colorful buildings and old cars, you know, what are you bringing to the table? You know, you just tread worn imagery that you're going over and over again. Is it, um, the, you know, the traditionally attractive person posing next to something? Is it the, um, the ruined porn or the stoic indigent man with a dog or, you know, what are these things that we, we've all internalized and you go somewhere unfamiliar and because you're unfamiliar with the place you are, you wind up falling on uh, into the rut of looking for those things, the things that you think are signature of the place versus trying to make your own photographs and your own statement about, you know, the condition of whatever it is you're looking at, right? And so I was reminded of, again, a Friedlander and like, I think he, there's, he's got some great examples, this being one of the more famous ones and this one too, of going someplace and coming back with something unexpected, right? Making a decision to look for something else, not look for uh, what was already there. Um, I think it is harder when you go to places like Cuba and India, assuming you're not Cuban or Indian maybe, and, and trying to get something that's not uh, just being, you know, the grand exotic thing that's being pushed at you. Uh, I was going to put McCurry there and then we'll look at these couple of Raghavir Singh photographs. If you've never looked at his book, Passage into India, all photographed using this car, the ambassador, it's, you know, incredible and like nothing else you've seen from there. And he wasn't just in his hometown, he traveled all over the country doing this work. And there's all of these scenes that are not what you would um, inherently think of when you think of uh, being in India. And I think all of us as photographers are we're aware of these tropes, of course, and uh, we're careful normally to steer clear of them or, or to at least be aware that, oh, you know, what am I doing? I'm just, you know, rehashing this thing that I've already seen a million times before. But there might be something about leaving home and traveling that makes it easier to not be as aware of them. You know, I think it's, you have to remain vigilant. And I certainly have several examples of like being in Turkey or not so much in Morocco, but when I was in Turkey, I, I photographed all these things that later I looked at this four by five film I shot and I thought, you know what, I just, I was just overwhelmed by the beauty of the place and the this and the that. And I didn't really get anything that I felt a personal connection to later. It was more of that kind of travel memento. So I think those are the kind of pitfalls. So I do think we need to remain vigilant and be careful in that situation for all the positives and the rewards, there's potential uh, downsides, right? So I, do, I did offer, uh, I invited three photographers, friends of mine to maybe comment on recent projects that they were doing where they were photographing while traveling. And uh, so I have Yola Monikoff Stockton, who I know is on because I saw her earlier. Uh, I hope Nat Ward made it on. We'll find out in a minute when I open it up. Uh, but he's got this new book, Big Throat. Oh, sorry, I should say Yola is going to be talking about this work she made in Hawaii. I know her brother lives there. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I'll just, I will have links to this later on the website where you can go and get to their websites to see later. Uh, Nat Ward has this book, Big Throat, that just came out, photographed actually very close to where I'm living now. So he's going to talk about this project and this process of putting that together. And then uh, Patrice Helmar, I also asked to come on and talk about work that she made in New Orleans. Uh, she's from Alaska, not from New Orleans, and she spent quite a bit of time. These, this photograph I'm showing here are a mix of New Orleans and uh, New Mexico and also uh, her home of Juneau. But uh, she spent a lot of time getting access to people, getting ways of uh, getting into people's homes and doing a lot of stuff down there. So I'm hoping she'll talk about that as well. And then the end of my shameless plug is, oh, well, look at this, it's on Amazon, how about that? All right, <laughs> so I'll stop sharing my screen and 
uh, if Yola, if you're still on, I thought we could start with you and then maybe we'll just go down the line like that. Oh, thank you, Kai. That's really it is great to hear. And I think you've covered a lot of what what I would uh, I would say, but I guess maybe to go off um, just to say a couple of words. Oh, oh sorry, I, I realized I should probably um, yeah, it's start, your start my video. Sorry about that. Uh, um, hope I can focus with the kids playing piano downstairs. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that you said that resonated for me was uh, the idea of community. And I also wanted to connect that to um, also something I've been thinking about now. I've, I've gotten into archival photography or just, you know, the, let's say the whole, like, like trying to conceptualize what uh, photographic, um history is or will be or what personal archives have meaning to me and and have cultural meaning for different groups of people you know for russia like how we experience russian photography like how if you're from russia you can understand uh something about uh, the lived history of um the place through photographs um and 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 also with hawaii you know this was something that i got into um working in hawaii was uh not just making my own photographs but then um going into the i discovered that there's a uh, state archive there and there's a library uh, the university library has these incredible archives and there's this whole kind of like bigger um thing of there are there are all, all these pictures of these places and uh and i've been trying to think about like you know what does that mean what do, what do you do with that i know that uh, like recently you know someone i i've uh been thinking about recently like as sam contis just did the project with dorothea lang and she did the other project um with the school out west but um but yeah so so with memory um i've been uh thinking i guess maybe like to invoke the idea of uh um, from Marcel Proust of, of remembering as a productive experience um, is, is a particular way that I think about photography and travel because um, maybe for me, like, because you had originally asked me to speak about Russia and then I thought, oh, maybe it's been, it makes uh, more sense to speak about um, Hawaii instead. But uh, one thing that I've been coming back to with, you know, like uh, uh, something that underlies my way of working is um, you know, like Joseph Kudelka, a kind of feeling of the exile, of being an exile and not actually having a sense of place. So if you say like, if you're going to oppose, what is it to photograph at home versus what is it to travel to photograph? And I would almost like, <laughs> like autistically not know the difference between what is home and what is not home even though that's silly to say like you know it means a lot to me like you know I live in Buffalo now and it means a lot to me that you know we have a mortgage on a, on a house uh, and you know and maybe that means that there is a home but it's also like when you were saying oh you know maybe there is a place that's so beautiful and magical or you know there's some landscape you want to experience I, I do feel like um, there's you know like in terms of like the pleasure of looking that in my own history, when I left um, the Soviet Union as a seven, uh, uh, as an almost seven-year-old, and we traveled, through, we spent two months in Italy. And when I first saw it, and we were in Rome, and when I first experienced Rome, like all the springs in my brain exploded. And then that was that, like, oh, the pleasure of looking, and that that was something that uh, um, stayed with me. Um, and made me want to photograph and then and then in terms of the thing about like paying the price with you know your your own body like when I first went to photograph overseas and I went you know I rejected well, you know I thought I was rejecting certain things about living in the United States and I thought I would move to the Middle East and embark on this career in photojournalism and within uh, six months or three months I, I had been uh, almost mortally wounded and then you know needed to make my way 
out of that. Um, and of course, that then uh, uh, cast a shadow on how to think about, uh, you know, like what, you know, uh, photographing for travel or photographing other places. But, um, but to bring, you know, just to, to quickly say about um, Hawaii and Russia, like uh, photographing in Russia, um, which is something I did um, a lot before going to grad school at Columbia and something I've started to go back to again a little bit recently, it is a way of um, kind of trying to understand um, the like kind of maybe trying to understand the self um, you know so then uh, and, and then it's also maybe something about trying to understand the past and 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 uh, I, I, I think um, like uh, you, you know like one thing I was I was thinking when you were speaking and this is maybe <laughs> like where like when one topic leads to other topics is it's um, like there's a question of approach like how do you approach photographing like what do you do do you just like wander around or do you drive around do you meet people in a kind of happenstance way uh, um, do you live as part of it and you know create a per, uh, uh, foster a particular community are you teaching in a place like all of that and then and then also like uh, you know how do you define what your work is like here in the great um, here I'm living in Buffalo and I'm like you know now photographing like tiny mollusks in a little light box but the mollusks are from here but they're um, you know they've traveled across the Atlantic from the former Soviet Union you know like so then what does that mean about like photographing plays um, and then uh, and then in, in terms of Hawaii um, yeah that uh, maybe just you know to, to close out uh, what I wanted to say is uh, uh, I, I am making I, I'm trying to kind of make sense of the colonial experience of what the United States is and like how um, how all of us came to be here and the relationship of, between that and uh, and uh, photography and so I've been you know making these pictures in a somewhat intuitive way uh, there but I've been also photographing my family and then I've been re-photographing the photographs of the uh, in the archive and then I, I don't quite know yet where it's all going um, but one thing that I that did occur to me is that I would like to give the picture that I make back to the archive and so that then it would be like um, kind of continuing this gesture of photographs serving as be, uh, belonging to the place where they were made and being part of the memory of that, that place. Oh great Yola, thank you. Um, so as I said, that's, I, I that's a lot. Yeah, that's for the moment. Um, I'll, uh, like I said, I will definitely link to your website so yeah. that people can see, look at that work. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I did want you to speak about it is also, as you, and you brought it up, is that kind of mirroring of Kadelka and like, what does it mean when you're no longer, you know, at the place where you might have been ancestrally connected or something, and now you're out in the world and as you said, every place you go maybe doesn't feel exactly like home. Although you, of course, make a lot of domestic work as well and photographing around mm -hmm. Buffalo and your family. But um, great, yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. I yeah. appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, thank you, Kai. So uh, moving along in my tabs on the browser as our order, uh, I'd, and I uh, hope we can ask Nat Ward to talk a little bit now about uh, his book that's just literally coming out uh, this month uh, called uh, Big Throat. And uh, as I said, coincidentally, happens to be photographed very near to where I'm sitting right now. So uh, Nat, I'll let you take it away. Oh, you're muted, just unmute yourself, eh? Don't forget to unmute, otherwise we won't be able to hear you. There you go. There I'm go. horrible at the internet. Just <laughs> want to put that out there. Yeah, no, I don't. I missed last week's photo topic because I'm terrible at the internet and I have a daughter, but I do still shoot film and, and I don't have to worry about these things. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess, because I, cause I've, I've traveled, you know, I was thinking a lot about Kai's presentation um, and a lot about the, the pitfalls um, because I have anxiety about those things um and and i've fallen into them many times and and i think that um there are kind of 
in retrospect, of course not in the moment. Um, I, I can't be quite that intellectually present in the moment, but in retrospect, you know, when, when things have kind of gone sideways or in, in my view, um, failed, it's, it's either because, you know, as Kai mentioned, I'm operating off of received information in some way. Um, you know, wh whether it be a proper, a proper solid cliche uh, or, you know, uh, the received information of, of being someone like I feel like most of us are, where we have a relatively sophisticated understanding of not just the history of photography, but also current trends in photography. Um, and it's almost like a, it's almost like a subconscious effort where I end up rehashing things that I've, I've just seen and really enjoyed. You know, I spent a number of years going down to Florida um, and just failing over and over again um, because, you know, I, I was just producing, it wasn't, wasn't quite ruined porn, but it, it certainly was, uh, you know, um, sad pictures of, of sad yet very attractive young white people. And, and I felt like, looking back at it now, I'm like, oh, I can see exactly where that fits into a certain genre of photography that was being deployed at the time. Um, so on the flip side, um, you know, in, the, in the, the rare moments where I feel like I've actually hit on something, um, it's, it's where I don't have an idea first. Like, um, it's it's really where I've where I've gone out um, without being in search of something, but and and this may sound a little like a little new agey funky, but it's where something in the place itself uh, pulls the work out of me, um, and that's what happened in Mexico, and and to a certain extent, I think uh, what's happened with some of my like current projects that I'm working on, whether it be in Queens, which is now home, but when I started the project was certainly not home, um, or out at Montauk, which is such a cheesy fucking place, but man, um, like I'm, I'm able to work there because I, I have very few ideas about, uh, about what that place really means or what that place is about. Um, and so, I, I mean, so it's a, it's those things like the, the the pitfalls discussion around cliche, but I think the pitfalls discussion, um, you know, didn't maybe maybe missed one thing which I which I well, which I know I've I've certainly dealt with, which is um, going out with this idea about what something means, and and maybe actually Kai to to to. Uh, completely contradict myself. I think you did kind of address that when you're dealing with um, with India and and juxtaposing Ragabir versus Joe McNally, whereas Joe McNally has some ideas, and yes, it's about exoticism, etc. Um, and Ragabir's feels much more like a like a a full exploration. And the last thing was, you know, the thing about um, the book Big Throat. There's a there's a written component, and it's a very uh, personal um, poem, like a ser series of poetic lines that run through the photographs. Um, but I always think that um, if you can't make a place part of your life, it's hard to make work out of it. Um, and so, you know, for that work, I, I, I spent from sunrise to sunset um, photographing for all of um, election day in 2016, which I was not present enough to really understand, you know, the future significance of that. I just happened to be there on that day and chose to photograph. Actually, like we got into a fight and I um, left. Quietly. Ellie, thank you for reading quietly. We got into a fight at a spa, and I'm bad at I'm 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 worse at the spa than I am at the internet, and so I left the spa to go um, sulk and make work. And in sulking and making work. From sunrise to sunset, um, you know the the place became a part of something I knew intimately. Um, Eliana, please don't read out loud. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, I think. Um, Hi. Yes, sweetie. I'm ta I'm talking to other folks right now. Sorry, I'm guys. Not, I'm not reading now. I'm reading stop. Okay, but can you read silently? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, so I think that um, at at any point where where traveling to make work has been successful, it's been a matter of of like fully investing myself in the place and making it a part of my own life and, and circling back to that, that Florida work. Um, you know, I was, I was trying to, to deal with a topic and Patrice and I actually had a conversation a long time ago, um, driving to a sandwich shop in New Jersey, um, that we have to go back to whenever you come back from Alaska and I'm allowed to leave my house. Um, that, you know, no matter no matter how pretty the pictures were, no matter you know you know technically interesting the topic was, um, the idea of addiction recovery wasn't a part of my life, and I was doing this kind of outsider in looking at at this place um, and and so you know I don't live in new mexico i've I've traveled to New Mexico often in my life. My aunt lives in Albuquerque. Um, but ostensibly it's not a part of my life. And it's funny, Kai, you mentioned like somebody yelling at you about being a Columbia professor, uh, going and making work about Tampa. Um, I got yelled at for my poetry, um, making work about, uh, you know, the high desert. Um, but I feel pretty confident that, that in giving myself over to the place, uh, in the way that I did for a day, um, that it really did become a part of my life. And I guess those are kind of the, the lines for me. It's like when you, when you travel somewhere, um, it can, it can work. Um, so long as, as, uh, you get out of your own way. And I, and I think that, I mean that kind of like get out of your own way for me, it works to get out of my own way cerebrally. Right. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I want to overthink things, but if I can just let go, and make and make the work in a place and actually explore it, then I'm better off. Um, sorry, that's not a very very direct kind of like discussion of the book itself. The book is um, deals with the place as you know an allegory, as an allegorical space uh, for coming to terms. Um, with your own secrets, right? So it has a lot to do with the shadows. And and again, uh, I have to call out Patrice because Patrice was there when I was making those prints in the dark room. Um, and I think that that uh, just to just to provide an easy transition here, um, I think Patrice and I at that point I don't want to I don't want to assume too much about Patrice, but I think we were both dealing with um, some pretty dark spaces in our own. In our own life and experience, um, I know we shared. I know we shared some songs and some tears in the dark room together. That was really important for me. Um, and I think, and and Patrice was printing the work that would become what she's going to talk about tonight as well. Um, and you know, that was that's kind of like secondary confirmation that you might have traveled to somewhere that's that's completely removed from your everyday life, um, but but there's a slim chance that you might find a piece of yourself in that space, um, even if you find it later on in the dark room. Um, and, and I think that's, when I think about travel photography, I do think about it in, in those terms of, um, I mean, it's really personal. What, what can you show of yourself uh, within a space um, that you have, <laughs> you have no business being in? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I guess that's a, a big rambling uh, transition into into Patrice talking about her work. Thanks, Nat. Uh, I think yeah, it's important that that con that idea, that concept of how these places then become part of your story, right? So, if if it's a place that you really connected to, it's going to be some place that you can go back to over and over again. Um, the last time I went to Tampa was. Oh, got it. it had been like at least six or seven years since I had last been there to photograph. And yet, as soon as I was on the ground there, I had, was having these flashbacks to 
you know, knowing where things were. And it was, it's, you know, it's constructing your own geography and your own landscape out of these places, of which, of course, is this constructed kind of reality. And, um, and I do think, not just in travel photography, but anytime you pick up the camera and go out the door, if you have the preconceived notion in your head of what you're trying to do, you're probably going to, you know, run into problems no matter what, right? Totally, totally. And so, uh, yeah, to transition over to Patrice, who's coming to us from her hometown of Juneau right now, and who's made many uh, cross-country journeys from New York to Alaska via other routes, and also was working, I had a residency in New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans features in my family story, so I'm always curious to see work from there. And uh, I think she wound up making work that isn't part of our sort of, it's not like the Mardi Gras pictures that we've seen a million times, so that's nice. Um, but uh, maybe Patrice is going to talk a little bit about um, not just New Orleans, but other stuff about these kind of road trips as well and sort of tie those things together and how she lands in a place and finds a way to connect to people and make these connections. So I'll turn it over to you, Patrice. Thanks, Ty. Thanks, Matt. Katie, it's great to see you and Ellie. And it's good to see uh, some adult faces and kid faces. Hi, Ellie. I just want to say one thing, Patrice. I'm a little upset that McCracken doesn't have video right now because I'm pretty sure his quarantine uh, hair beard combo is a little epic. Yeah. Um, James, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. Yeah, I think everybody's hair is a little epic right now in a good way. Um, I love this thing I grew up hearing um, in my family. Uh, my mom's family is Irish American. And they say that when the rich travel, they go on vacation. And when the poor travel, they go home, right? Um, and so I've had the luxury of being able to go on some vacations in my life. But um, I wanted to start with that thought about a vacation and travel and um, you know class which is a big part of things that I think about and things that I'm thinking about um, as the shit hits the fan in our country right now right um, so I just wrote a few things down so I wouldn't totally Chris Farley this thing and uh, ramble on I asked myself some questions here uh, what does it mean to leave home to return and to be like Ulysses, a stranger at the gate, the uncertain, certain fate and toughness of being of belonging to a one horse town that I recognized as my own, right? So that's something that I'm always kind of thinking about. I loved um, the Odyssey and the Iliad growing up as a kid, um, hearing those stories and like revisiting that idea of the, the hero's tale in that seven year journey, trying to like get back home, going to war uh, in Troy and coming back home. I think the best work, the best literature, the best art, the best music has illusion in it. A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, right? Not I-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, I can't spell. Um, but maybe it has both of those things, things that remind us of other things or, um, remind us of ourselves or things in myth um, or the Bible and religion or whatever we believe in or cling to. Um, and then the other quote that I always think about in terms of going out and making this work in different parts of the country is written by one of my heroes, Carson McCullers, the great uh, su Southern writer. She wrote this in an essay in the 1960s. Um, she said, it is a curious emotion, the certain homesickness that I have in mind. And with Americans, it is a national trait. As native to us as the roller coaster or the jukebox, it is no simple longing for the hometown or country of our birth. The, emo the emotion is Janus-based. We are torn between a nostalgia for the familiar um, and long for the foreign and strange. As often as not, we are homesick most for the places we have never known. So there's this part of us belonging to the United States, folks of us that aren't native to this place, which is most of us by and large, that is really seeking for 
something to connect to, right? Or some sort of sense of home. Um, and of course, the history of photography is rife with just the most uh, screwed up examples of colonialism and this idea of being American, quote unquote, capital A, um, which really offends, you know, Canada and South America that we even call ourselves Americans sometimes. Um, so I don't know. In speaking about my own experience, I don't want to prattle on too much, but those are just a couple things that I'm thinking about or things that I, that I think of. Okay. Uh, what about just, um, so I think that for people that are on the road or traveling, it's like, for example, when I was photographing in Tampa, other than maybe the person at the bagel store and the someone at the motel, uh, the you know, front desk at the motel, I didn't really speak to many people in Tampa while I was photographing. So I was there to photograph, except for the first time I was there. And so I wasn't trying to make work that I needed to get access to people's homes or I needed this kind of other access to it. And uh, I think what's interesting about the work you made while you were there on that residency and other trips you've made is that, you know, there's photographs from people's backyards, there's photographs from people's bedrooms. And so maybe you could speak to just this idea of being somewhere that's not home and yet becoming over, you know, getting familiar with people in a place that you land in. Right. Well, if you've ever been to a sandwich shop with me in New, New Jersey, like the words have been, you know, that um, I pretty much talk to everybody. And that's just part of my personality is a curiosity about other people. And I've been like that since I was a really little kid. So I think that there, it's, it's also about who we are, the pictures that we make, you know, if we're interested in, in, um, in the lives of other folks or, um, you know, see something familiar and strangers. Um, yeah, so I would say it's a curiosity or just like part of, uh, part of who I am. So you can't help yourself in other words, right? Yeah, nope. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, well, I want to thank the three of you guys for just taking the prompt and, and showing up and, uh, and talking, but um, I'll open it up now to uh, anyone who just wants to, um, like I said, I think we've all had this experience and maybe we can mention some positives or some of the, the uh, pitfalls as well. That'd be great to just hear some stuff about that. So uh, I'll open it up to anyone who wants to talk. And don't forget, you have to unmute yourself. Unmute. Oh, yeah. Hi. I just wanted to add one more thing um, that uh, in relationship to pitfalls that I meant to say, um, which, is, which is that when I was a photojournalist, one thing that occurred to me, uh, or uh, no, it never occurred to me. It occurred to me years later. But, um, you know, I, I, now have all, I, I now have all this film that of of all these photographs that I made in people's homes in Afghanistan and Jordan and Iraq and like Israel and the West Bank and Uzbekistan that you know I can go on but but uh like you know I'm this is I, I'm responding to what uh Patrice was saying um you know the the colonial sort of legacy or history of photography and um you know the fact that a sort of sort of like as as photographers we come to to it with the perspective of our experience and what do we wish to like what is our hero how how am i the hero of my story um but uh years later it, it i realized I, f I felt a certain sadness about the fact that i have these pictures of people's lives and uh from from moments that were sometimes devastating or beautiful or banal or whatever but that they don't have them and uh you know and then there are all these tangential issues about copyright and permission and you know rights grabs from photo agencies and you know how images are used and this is maybe a kind of other thread um that that i've become interested in i don't know if anyone wants to comment but uh uh 
uh, on, on this question, um, but but with relation to travel, there's always that kind of uh, duality about um, how are we, like, are we wanted in a place, you know, like I know Patrice is always wanted, you know, I can imagine like that, you know, there's a certain kind of human interaction that, that can be rewarding for the person um, who's, who's uh, being photographed. And that, that's something that I think I was not aware of, like the value of that act of photography to, to the person whom I'm photographing. And, you know, maybe like the word community, I feel like is so uh, over overused these days, but like, you know, it's actually been two years since I've, I've been back in Hawaii, but uh, as I was planning to be there, like actually I would have already come back. I was planning to be there this spring, but ne but it suddenly became so important to me to, to establish those connections and to have the work have a stake for the people, like for, for, for the people from the place that's um, being talked about. And like, even with Raghavir Singh's work, I, you know, I don't know, um, you know, <laughs> that's another discussion, but like that car going through all those different neighborhoods and like the chauffeured car and looking at all these people um, and and like what, it, what you know, what it, like, it, it, it just strikes me when you look at um, certain kinds of photographs from like people's family albums, how sometimes they don't look like the kinds of photographs that we make, and that that that's that um, what people are um, you know want to see sometimes are pictures of the people they love, and you know lovingly depicted. And, and, you know, like, what is that photography, like, uh, what does that type of photography have to do with um, the photography of, tra you know, <laughs> the photos we make while traveling? So yeah, I mean, obviously, you now you're talking about context of the work and what is if you're a photojournalist or if you're there, if you're a travel photographer who's out supposing to boost up tourism or, you know, what's the intentions? Um, I think that, I mean, I, I do think it's, there's a lot of thin ice on one hand. And when we look in the history of photography, there's of course these things that can be troublesome. But on the other hand, I, you know, I know with all of this postmodern uh, rereading of everything, that's I think can go too far as well. I mean, I think we do all have our valid, you know, um, means of going out in the world and things we're doing and, you know, we can get back to intentions or if your heart's in the right place and all these sorts of things. But um yeah, I don't, personally, I don't feel that as much of that connection of like this idea of giving back to the archive or giving back in these sorts of ways. But I do think that can happen when you walk out your front door and go five minutes away, right? Could, you could have those same sort of things happen with your neighbors, maybe less likely, but, but certainly could happen. Um, but I do think now these days we're so much more self-conscious about our our journey out into the world and what we might be doing and making and uh, I think if hopefully people are less uh, heavy-handed about it of course and you know this early examples I was showing were you know we all know that Curtis is dressing people up and you know there's all kinds of crazy stuff but you know I don't know how much of that we have to um, take on ourselves in 2020 but maybe I don't know someone could else could comment on that but um, but thanks Yola. Um, who else? Anyone else have uh, anything they want to talk about for problems with journeys or problems with going out in the world? Um, you know, going somewhere too exotic, I think, you know, that certainly could be a case where you just land somewhere where you're just completely above your head because you have no idea what the hell is going on. Um, I didn't mention it in the slideshow, but I do know that photographers like Friedlander have spent years photographing in uh, India and maybe maybe he went to China too, or Africa too. I know he definitely went to India and no one's ever seen any of those pictures, I think because he doesn't feel like they're Friedlander pictures, I'm guessing, I don't know, but there's there's failure built into it, right? Even though if you have the effort, if you put in all that time, like Nat was talking about all those journeys, I remember making so many trips down there and you know, perhaps nothing comes of it. Could be interesting too. I think it may be a, a, a little bit of a bridge is that oh nice I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, diplomacy oh. <laughs> um, no it, it, like i 
wonder if there is is um, I wonder if there is value in this is less about kind of the the repetitive failure of going to a place over and over again, but it it, it does relate a little bit. I, I just wonder if um, you know with just thinking about Yola's comment about Ragabir, right, um, and being chauffeured around. Um, I wonder if there's value in that that level of of honesty about about one's place uh, in a particular uh, cultural or, or socioeconomic structure, right? Um, that that kind of um, if it's if there's a self awareness to it, and I'm not I'm not positing because I never knew the guy. I have no fucking idea. But but if there's a kind of self awareness about the absurdity of the situation, um, if there's something uh, human in just saying, you know, like, yeah, this is who I am, this is where I am, and perhaps this is useful uh, in some way to someone, right? Um, I recognize there's a lot of equivocation in there, but that's kind of like the beginning of of the photographic effort is eh, I don't know maybe like maybe Lee going to India I don't know maybe and then in the end it's not. Right, um, but but I wonder if uh, you know because there are ethical complexities in this idea of travel photography. You mentioned postmodernism, you know, um, but also in in a moment that's so fraught um, with with issues of identity and identitarian kind of uh, fundamentalist ideology. Um, I think it's hard to be to be um, to admit that that you're a messy human. And I think maybe there's some value in that. And I think travel is a place where there's a lot of opportunities to step in a pile of I'm, I'm human kind of shit. Great. Yeah, we all are human, there's no doubt about it. And which means that there's, uh, you bring everything that you bring to it, hopefully you're bringing it with you as you go out and uh, make those photographs. And uh, yeah, there's probably, sometimes you probably have to step in it too, right? Otherwise you're being too careful. Um, I could say that I stepped in it. All right, Tony, let's hear. Uh, well, you know, I photographed a project that is very controversial uh 20 years ago and maybe 100 years from now and i don't think that it's ever going to stop being controversial so but um i had to do it I had to make it I had to make the work so are what talking, was that yeah i was about to say are you talking about the cockfighting or cock fighting mm -hmm. that was me a little trouble tony <laughs> it, it it gave a, a lot of trouble to michael <laughs> yeah, so Tony was photographing fighting roosters for a number of years, and you traveled too, because you you wound up traveling and uh, and yeah. you know being part of the whole scene in a way too, right? Yeah, I became part of the whole culture. I actually became a spectator for two years before I introduced the camera. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean. Uh, but uh, you don't have any regrets for making the work, I would imagine, right? Absolutely not. Yeah. And you weren't a complete tourist, Tony, right? No, no, I wasn't a complete yeah. tourist. But um, um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm in an island that is 95% uh, black. And, uh, you know, in, in, in a cock ring, I'm the only white person with a camera and a flash. So, yeah, I stood out big time. Well, I think going back to what I was saying at the beginning about, you know, why we value the artist or why we value someone who's like put themselves out there. I don't think the, you know, it's not just discomfort of they traveled or they had to crawl over the mountain and get uh, briars on their face or whatever. There's, I think this is also part of the price you pay, the price you pay of, you know, being that person who's there photographing, right? I mean, to be photographing it, means you're outside of it. And because of that, you're already one step removed no matter what. Even if you're photographing the family and everything, you're still, your response is a different one than if you were uh, just there without the camera. So it's kind of built in. And maybe that's part of what we value too, is that 
that's the person who's willing to be embarrassed perhaps or to step in their humanness uh, is that they're willing to make that happen, right? They're, they're making that journey for us. So I think there's a way of thinking about it in those terms as well. And by the way, the, the journey, I think, wasn't just my journey. I think that I wanted to prove the, um, all the stories that my, told, my dad told me that he was actually um, part of cockfighting when he was in Cuba. And so he would tell me all these amazing stories. And so one of the things I wanted to do was basically to prove him wrong, that all these stories were very like super heightened and he would recreate or mentally create these stories and to be better than what they really were. But um, at the end, uh, he was right and I was completely wrong. Hmm. That's interesting. So you wind up making a connection, yeah. All right, um, anyone else have something they wanna to add to the topic? Uh, Sheila, do you have anything? Um, I, I feel like I have traveled right here in my own hometown because the past seven weeks have not been my town. So <laughs> I really feel like it is part of me, um, but it's a new part of me. Yeah, the familiar becoming unfamiliar, right? So it's... That, that, that coffee shop, that coffee shop project I was working on has taken on a whole new direction here. We call ahead, uh, we pay ahead, uh, we stand six feet apart, we go up to the window when it's our turn, and then we move away. You know, it's just a total, total different world. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Yoav, you've been quiet this time. Do you have anything you want to add? You, I know you've, I could have mentioned your project. You had that uh, great project from your being uprooted and just, you know, constantly on the move for all those years. Um, no, I, I actually, I, was, I, I thought that we, we kind of drifted to ethical issues in photographing in foreign lands rather than actually what does it mean to really you know, decide that your work is somewhere else uh, versus we are familiar. And, and traveling is, I think there, there's so many different subcategories on that as well. You know, um, you know, I think the most extreme version of, I know of, of my understanding of photographers that really stay the most local possible is probably Tom Roma. You know, out of what, 16, 17 books, only two of them are outside of Brooklyn, you know. And that's inc incredibly, you know, stationary. Uh, on the other hand, you know, for other photographers, like maybe even myself, I've made most of my work away from where I lived or where if I photographed there, I was away from there, you know. Um, but well, there you know, do you, I have a question, just a quick question for you. Do you feel like when you're photographing the work in your neighborhood in Tel Aviv, um, the more recent work where you're photographing from your, from your window, right? Did you feel that, that that had more of a relationship to being a stranger in a place that was supposed to be home, so a kind of travel, or no? Yeah, I think that, you know, my, my it feels to me most of the time that I photographing is, is a type of travel. And as soon as you're actually behind a camera, the world is very different. And however familiar you are, uh, the world is very different when you're photographing it. Because you also have different objectives, you know. We're, we're always coming with a certain objective to photograph and you start talking about Kai talked about the FSA. Uh, none of the photographers were from the South, right? Um, and maybe they had a certain idea of how poverty should look like and then the, that's how they made their pictures, right? And I think that we can all be guilty in that sense, but travel, travel and travel photography and travel to photograph are very different things, I think. And we can spend many hours, you know, making those distinctions, you know. Um, and of course, there is a big difference between traveling in the United States where you can speak the language versus traveling in Cambodia, right? Or traveling in any other country that you do not speak the language, that you don't look like the others, that you are, you know, from one way or another. And that happened, you know, to me many times in my life. Um, so it's a very different, I think, 
understanding the space around you as well. But the objectives are to make photographs, right? Eventually. So hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. All right, we're at, uh, I think we're just a little slightly over an hour. So uh, I think uh, unless anyone had something they were dying to add to the topic uh, that we'll, we'll call this one a day. Um, I really want to thank uh, Nat, Yola, and Patrice for agreeing to uh, speak and add their voice to the topic because I, I did want to have kind of open it up this week for that. And um, otherwise, I hope everyone uh, pays attention and for next week. I promise I will double check that I don't send out a bad link in an email. But if not, you can always go to that wacky new website, lunacaruna.com and uh, find the link there. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I hope everyone has a great and safe week.